Let's remain standing for a moment. Don't sit down yet. Don't sit down yet. I just want you to remain standing just for a moment. Uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time, we're so grateful that you are here, so excited that you are here with us. Um, if you don't mind, again, as you know, my spiel, we are in Antioch. We're an introvert-friendly church. So if you're an introvert, we're not going to put you on the spot and make you turn to your neighbor. Don't feel a need to turn to your neighbor. If you're an introvert, you're a little shy, it's okay. We're an introvert-friendly church. But if you don't mind letting us know that you're visiting with us for the first time, if you don't mind, if you would, just throw your hand in the air and wave it like you just don't care. If you're visiting with us for the first time, just throw your hand in there, wave at us, wave at us. Antioch, if you see a hand around you, would you act like you have some home training and go show them some love, please, really? and start heading toward 2 Chronicles, the first chapter, 2 Chronicles, the first chapter. Um, and as you're doing that, I want to uh, share with you something I'm going to be doing uh, next Saturday. I want you to come with me if you want to. Um, but next Saturday at 7.15 p.m. at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, uh, there will be a double feature, a double feature, uh, an opera, um, Highway 1, but then also um, The Dwarf. There'll be two, two uh, uh, shows, double feature. And uh, the first is a tribute to Steele, the, the dean, known, he's known as the dean of black opera. And I think it's fitting uh, for Black History Month that we go and celebrate and support and show up in good numbers. Um, I'm, I'm a, a co-host for that night. And so I would love for you to join me there at the LA Opera this coming Saturday at 7, 15, PM, all right? Listen, uh, some of you have gone online already. Uh, we've seen some, some purchases there. Make sure you put in the code W Cheney. This is not a fundraiser. I'm not getting anything. I just want to make sure that um, you get a discount. I think it's 30% discount if you go online um, to do that. Uh, but we have tickets available today. We have a select number of tickets available today. If you're like me, I don't want a digital ticket. You know, I went to go see. I'm not going to tell you I went to go see uh, a couple months ago. And because uh, you may judge me, you know, you guys listening to nothing but gospel 24 7 um and I, I do to edify my spirit but um you know i went and did one of those what was it v, one of those ticket companies and i didn't realize that i was buying a ticket from somebody that had a ticket and man i didn't get my ticket until 10 minutes after the show i i, I so it, it's, it's funny it's tricky uh digitally sometimes so for those who are like me, I'm innovative in some ways, old school in others, and when it comes to shows and my tickets, I want them in my hand. Are you with me? So for those of you who are like me, I have some, they'll be out front um, in a couple levels. I think there is, uh, you know, there's a balcony seating, good balcony seating. Um, I think it's $49, $69 for um, the other seating. Um, in the loge, I believe it's $69. And then, um, I have a handful of tickets. There are not many, so you want to, uh, if you're interested in this, um, I'll be in the founder circle, um, and uh, those are, are good seats. Um, and also, for those who have those tickets, um, there is a special reception at intermission in the founder's room, and I would love for you to be my guest there, um, but you have to make sure you get those tickets here. If you run out today, I think there's only 10 or so of those, um, then we'll make sure, we ha I think we have a few more. Uh, but again, looking forward to seeing you there, and we'll hang out a little bit um, this coming Saturday. If you have your Bible, Second Chronicles, beginning at the first chapter, first chapter, Second Chronicles one. When you get there, say, "I'm there." So grateful to see you all in the house today. I'm gonna get you out before the rain. So I'm glad you came. For those who stayed at home because you thought it was going to rain, God bless you. You still get the same word, but you can't get a hug. <laughs> Second Chronicles, the first chapter, beginning at the sixth verse. And I plan to finish this message today. It was meant to be a message. We are on the fifth part of our series now. <laughs> it 
was meant to be one message, but I want to uh, get through this today um, because I have so much more I want to share with you in the weeks to come. Uh, Second Chronicles, the first chapter, beginning at the sixth verse, and it reads, Solomon went up there before the Lord to the bronze altar, which was at the tent of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. In that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask what I shall give you. Solomon said to God, you have dealt with my father David with great loving kindness and have made him or me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, your promise to my father David is fulfilled for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me your wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can rule this great people of yours? God said to Solomon, because you had this in mind and you did not ask for riches, wealth, or honor, or the life of those who hate you, nor have you even asked for long life, but you've asked for yourself wisdom and knowledge that you may rule my people over whom I've made you king. Wisdom and knowledge have been granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings that were before you have possessed, nor those that will come after you. Verse number 13. So Solomon went from the high place, which was at Gibeah, from the tent of meeting to Jerusalem, and he reigned over Israel. Right before you take your seats, if you would, turn to no less than five people and tell them, do not fumble the bag. Tell them, do not fumble. So we began this series with not the son, Solomon, who was entrusted with what David prepared for him, but we began this series with David. And I share with you, as it relates to the trajectory for this year, this was the message that began this year. And this is an extension of the prophetic message that was to set course into, to ground our mindset for this year. And it's this idea that there's so much in our heart we want to accomplish, but ultimately this is the year that God will do more than we ever imagined. God will do the unbelievable again, but not the way you planned it. David asked, not only because he was a worshiper more than he was a king, and if he had to choose in between worshiper and king, he would have chosen worshiper all day, every day. But also because a king's legacy in that day, and I shared it with you, even in um, ancient Mesopotamia, there was, beginning there in, in many respects, for thousands of years after, the grandeur of a city was measured by its religious structure. Um, and David says, I want to, before I die, build a temple for the Lord. I want to build a glorious temple because I'm living in a panel house while the Lord's presence, the Ark of the Covenant, is behind a curtain. It was an issue of prioritization. David says, I would like to prioritize God. I would like to prioritize the presence of God, and I want to make the presence of God central because anywhere the presence of God is central, there will be blessing. The presence of God is central in your house, there will be blessing there. If the presence of God is central in your church, there will be blessing there. If the presence of God is central in your relationship, there will be blessing there. Wherever the presence of God is central and people are sensitive to the presence of God, there is blessing bestowed. David says, I want to build a temple. This is not only symbolic, but it is a, a gesture of honor. And the prophet turns to him and says, uh, good, do all that's in your heart. But as he goes off, he comes back and tells him, God is going to build a temple, but not the way you anticipated. God is going to allow your son Solomon to build the temple. Solomon's going to do what's in your heart. So if you can exchange your right now for your later on, I'll exceed your expectation. He says, you're not going to build a temple right now. Your son, your descendant's going to build the temple. 
And as your son builds the temple, while you don't get to build the temple in your lifetime, I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to do you one better. He says, I'm going to give you a legacy that outlives you, one that is an everlasting kingdom. He says, if you can do it my way and lay down your dream, your aspiration, your vision, offer it to me and allow me to remix it to give it back to you better. David said, cool, I'm going to do that. But I'm sure there were some tears in his eyes when God changed his role from builder of the temple to supplier for the builder. So David then left and he began to do supplies. I don't have to drop these bricks. I made it so I wouldn't have to carry it so far. The brethren brought it right here for me. (laughs) David, I'm sure with tears in his eyes, said, Lord, I'm okay with playing the role of I don't have to dunk this one, but I'm going to throw the lob for my son Solomon to dunk it. I'm going to set things in place in my generation for my son's generation to do what they couldn't do if I didn't put things in place. He says, I'm going to go and I'm going to get a good insurance policy, even though I myself in my lifetime won't be a billionaire. He says, this is not the ultimate But it's setting my son up for the ultimate. And if I can be a kingmaker and not be obsessed with being a king, God will establish long-term legacy for me. So it's generational transfer, one generation to the next. He comes and he gives. Solomon, everything he needs to build. He carries the supplies. He carries the the cedar. He carries the stone to build the temple so that when Solomon comes along, he has everything he needs, all the supplies he needs to build the temple. Now, here is the issue. It is only a legacy if it is received and stewarded properly. Part of the challenge is if There are not a people prepared to receive what God has laid aside for them, the efforts of the previous generation, the efforts of those who have sacrificed go by the wayside. I don't have time to go through the commentary of what happens to the house that mama took her entire life, daddy took his entire life to acquire once they're gone. There's no thought for what kind of continuity will go from one generation to the next in, in For lack of a better phrase, the the bag is fumbled. And the pattern is perpetuated for for another generation. But, But nestled in Solomon's response to what he received is wisdom for our own generation. And not just those who are the next generation, but those who have things to steward now. There's some of you in this place, you've, you've, you've been in your career for years and you're successful in your own right, but you're getting ready to get calls from people who have seen how you've handled yours. And please hear me prophetically. You're going to get calls to, to inherit things that you didn't work for because they don't have anybody to entrust it to. Look at your neighbor and tell, yeah, if you're clapping, you, you know, you're vibing with me. If you're not, it's okay. You, you, you don't have to receive that one. It ain't for everybody. But, but please hear me. There's some stuff coming that you did not work for. There are people watching the diligence in which you are faithful over what you've received who are going to give you what you couldn't have done if they didn't bring you into it. Are you with me? They saw how you handled your business and all their kids are crazy. They're going to try to give you their company. Are you here with me? They saw how you served in someone else's ministry. I can't tell you the people that have been in ministries waiting for the pastor to die, only for the pastor to choose someone who honored their pastor outside of the ministry in a better way than those that were in the ministry honored him. I've seen people receive empires from a pastor who was down the street and around the corner watching how they served their pastor in the little church. God, I want you to receive this, is getting ready to bring you into opportunities you didn't work for because of how you positioned yourself with what you have, where you are. So let's go through it. Here we go. Number one, Solomon 
The passage I brought to you today, it, it speaks to how Solomon began this journey. Number one, if you want to not fumble the bag, you have to start by acknowledging the source. Before Solomon does anything as it relates to leadership, he honors two people. He honors his father David by doing what David said to establish his kingdom. Before he does his own thing, he finishes the unfinished, he finishes the unfinished, I wish I had another word, he finishes the what was undone. <laughs> that, that's that, that English teacher that was, that was in 12th grade that says, don't, don't be redundant, don't you say the same thing twice, all right, here it is. He, he finishes what was undone in David's generation at his request and then before, again, before he goes into his own, before he does his own thing, before he remixes the plan, before he changes the company, what he does is honors the request of the one that he received it from. Very important. Doesn't mean that he has to be just like David or do just what David did. It would be a disservice for Solomon to do just what David did because God didn't raise up Solomon after David's death to do exactly what David did. God did not raise you up after your predecessor to do what your predecessor did. But he did raise you up to honor the predecessor that you receive what you receive from so that now you can go and build what God has put in your heart. But most of us skip a step. We dishonor the source of the supply. I know God's the ultimate source, and we know how to honor God, but the challenge is we've learned how to honor God and not honor earthly sources. Are you still here with me? But God honors your honor, even if it's an imperfect source, God honors your honor honor of that source. Solomon does what David asked him to finish up, and then he goes to pray to God to give him direction for what he will do in his generation. Can I tell you how much is lost in translation or in transition because of what's, because we miss what Solomon had. What did Solomon have? Number one, he had honor. He had honor for his father David. He had honor for what he received. And he had honor for God. Before he ever asked anything of God, follow me, he sacrifices 1,000 burnt offerings. Could you imagine how long that took to sacrifice 1,000 burnt offerings on the altar before he ever asked God for a thing. How do we honor God with the opportunity? Is God the first consideration as new doors of opportunity open up to us? Or, or is human honor a reality? As new doors and new territory opened up to us, Solomon, number one, how do you not fumble the bag? You become a person of honor, number one. Solomon was a person of honor. He honored both divine source, but also human source. I have a great friend of my grandfather's. Y'all remember, we used to go do anniversaries with him all the time. His name was Dr. E.W. McCall. And when I came to Antioch, he said, he saw me coming and just wanting to just, just do my thing. It was a new generation. I'm getting ready to do a new thing. And ultimately, in the heart of every good leader, including my grandfather, he wanted to see a new generation do a new thing. But he did not want to see me do a new thing while dishonoring what came before me. And he pulled me aside because he saw with my zeal, I was just, I'm going to bring something new. I'm going to bring something new. Like nothing was happening before I got there. I'm going to bring something new. I'm going to bring something new. Like, like, like I could do my new thing without their old resource. Uh, I'm going to do with this stuff what, what, what nobody, what none of y'all have done without thanking you for the stuff that I have to do something with. And as I was getting ready to floss on the generation 
that brought the material because I thought I could build something that hadn't been built. He called me aside. He said, ah. He used to talk like that. He said, ah. He called me Cheney. Ah, Cheney, ah, brother Cheney. He said, ah, Cheney. He said, don't use your influence until you get it. Dang. I thought I fooled everybody with this three-piece suit. He said, don't use your influence until you get it. Here's the idea. He said, you're going somewhere and you will be at a place where you have enough influence, credibility to do what's in your heart. But if you don't understand this principle of honor and you dishonor what is while you're trying to get to what will be, you'll never get to what will be because this thing will fall apart before you have enough influence to build with the materials that they brought you. So before we go anywhere, we have to establish, say honor. 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 That's how, number one, how you don't fumble the bag. But number two, not only did Solomon establish honor, that's all review. Solomon, number two, Solomon was a man of humility. I'm not going to labor through this because we did it last week, and I'm not going to preach last week, this week, so that I'll be in the same message next week. <laughs> we done today. <laughs> Solomon said, number one, he honored God. He honored his father. How do you not fumble the bag? Number two, he did this. Notice this. Because honor is the pathway to access. Many of you think it's your education, and it's a beautiful thing. I celebrate education. I'm going all the way. But the reality is a person can walk you in with the right relationship and proper honor into spaces that all of your intelligence will never allow you into. Amen. A person. Person. But the second thing that allows a person to do that and also God to do what God desires to do in you is not only humility, I mean, in honor, but secondly, it is humility. Solomon looks to God and says, I'm sure he was intelligent. He studied the best schools. He was a king's son, okay? He, he, he had homeschool uh, tutors and studied at the best university, the finest establishments. Wherever there was knowledge, he had access to it. He was a king's son. He was a successful king's son. David was not a struggling king. Are you still here with me? Solomon had the best of education, the best of the resources. He understood philosophy. Solomon understood theology. Solomon understood natural sciences. Solomon was a person that was well capable of doing what was before him, but he sacrificed to the Lord, honors his father, Father, honors the Lord, but notice the humility. He said, God, I don't know what I am doing. So he does not offer to God all that he knows. He offers to God what he does not know. Can I tell you how to elevate not only on the divine plane but in the natural plane too? Here's the problem with most of us. When we come to people that can help us, we get in their presence and try to impress them by throwing at them everything that we know. Everything that we know. And here's what it does to a person that can help you when you get in their presence to try to impress them by throwing everything that you know, they say, well, why are you here, number one? Number two, sometimes they, it could feel to them as if you're trying to rub shoulders while they know you're not on their level. <laughs> Solomon had the goods, but he did not offer to one that was had more and one that was the source of what he needed all of his proficiencies, he looked for the few deficits and said, not that I was educated well, not that I was the most qualified in my family. God, I, I know I have it all figured out, but there are a few things that I'm still working out. He, in humility, looks to God and says, I do not know what I'm doing. Some of y'all been chasing down that mentor that can change your life for years and they've been evading you. 
And you had to wonder, does my breath stink? Do I have a booger in my nose? Why are they ducking me? Because you're offering to them everything that you do know. And while competency is important, most people want to give what they have to a person that has some sort of need. Are you still here with me? Try offering them where you've come short. Try offering them what you don't know. Try giving them what they have that you don't have yet but if you did have what they had you could get to the next place he comes in humility don't fumble the bag transition well you must take on humility realizing that your way is not the only way your thoughts are not the only thoughts about this your direction is not the only direction and your competency is still limited he says God with everything I have as a king's son I don't know Number three, here we go. But not only did he offer him honor, humility, here we go, today's lesson, here we go. He offered him, or he was a man of faith. Now I know for many of us there's a disconnect between success and our faith, but please understand, Solomon was a man of faith. Faith. And in his faith, he grasped the enormity of the task. And with the enormity of the task, he realized that it was beyond him, and he seeks God's help. He seeks God's help. He comes and he seeks God's help. Before he gets the hustle playbook, he seeks God's help because he realizes that if he, through mechanics, is able to yield something in his life. His character and his spirit will sabotage his success, and it will not be long-term or permanent. He says, Lord, before you do this for me, do something in me. <laughs> Question. If you're taking notes, it's going to be a sober one today. What does ha God have to do in you? Let's be honest. Be, be be honest, because Solomon had what many of us don't have, and that is sobriety about ourself. And our well-habituated ego responses will not allow for us to see our deficits, only to see our strengths. Solomon was able to clearly identify these things. The question to you is, what needs to change in you before you can receive and not mess up what God has for you. Be honest. Be honest. I just want to be honest. <laughs> be honest. Is it your attitude? Is it an inability to keep your composure under pressure? Is it, is it your vice? I just said that to make everybody feel comfortable because it got real quiet. <laughs> you fill in your blank. Whatever it is, are you aware of what God needs to do in you before you're able to handle what God has for you? Because if God doesn't do it in you and you don't make it a priority to, for God to do it in you, you will, not only God, but you will repel the things that you want. You want a good man who sees you, but you're giving off toxicity from your last situation. And ain't no good man looking for that. If it does not happen in you, you will repel what God has for you. Even if God doesn't prevent it, natural science will prevent it. You will repel what you desire to attract because you have a desire in your head, but you're emitting a frequency because there, is still, there are still some half-baked things on the inside of you. 
If you desire safety, but internally you still want to explore, there's still some things that have got to be dealt with in you before you find a situation that will feel safe to you because no one ultimately who brings safety wants indecision. All right. I used to like when there's a rousing amen. Now I like when it becomes deathly silent. When God gives this stuff, it's for both of us, all of us. What if somebody said amen? <laughs> but one of the ways, how do you strengthen in you how do you create enough fortitude in you to receive what God has for you? Listen to me. You don't start with the pursuit of what you are after. You start with the pursuit of God. I know, I know, I know it feels like delayed gratification. But hear me. You get what you're after, not by pursuing what you're after. Because it will be chasing a win. It will be putting it into a purse with holes in it. It'll be, you'll, it'll elude your grasp. As you try to squeeze it, it will, it will ooze between your fingers and you'll never be able to obtain it. The only way back to, to the path of receiving what God has for you and maintaining what God has for you is to not start with what you're after, to go harder for what you're after. Somebody in here has been hustling harder than you ever have the last year and you've had less because every time you get there, something comes up to take away what you were after. And sometimes it is not just bad luck. Sometimes it's not just coincidence. Sometimes it is not the devil. Sometimes... Is God saying, I'm waiting to bless you, but I cannot bless what does not start with me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And here's what happens when you seek God's first, God first. When you chase God more than you chase all those things, even in the lean times, even when it doesn't come together, even when you're still in the struggle, when you're with God and pursuing God, you're in the struggle in peace. You, you cry with a joy in your heart because he have the presence of the one who is the giver of good gifts. And if I have the presence of the, presence of the one who is the giver of good gifts, I have the peace of his presence before he ever releases to me what he has. There is no better way than to start with God. Look at your neighbor and tell start with God. Start with God. And if you feel like it's been eluding your grasp, go back to God. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody tipped in here, don't even know why you're here this Sunday. You can put your finger up and walk out right after this. God sent me in this place to remind you that you got to start with him. Go back to the Lord. Prioritization of his direction, prioritization of his purpose, prioritization of his plans, prioritization of the things that he has for you. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Go back to God. Go back to God. Solomon, he starts with the Lord. He, he, he honors God. And the way you not, don't fumble the bag is you, you honor God. He, he doesn't do it David's way, but he takes David's God with him into a new place. And one thing that my heart is for right now more than anything, listen, I may not give my kids $10 million. I may not, well, hopefully, I'm going to try, try my best to do all I can. I may not give my kids, be able to give my kids everything I desire in my heart. But if I can give them nothing, I want to give them the God that picked me up, the God that was there for me when no one else was, the God that, that regulated my mind, the God that kept 
kept me in my right mind when I should have lost it. The God that opened up doors of opportunity. The God that gave favor. The God that made a present, a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The God that made me love my enemies. The God, the God, the God that, that put me in places I was not qualified for. The God that, that qualified me and had things come out of my mouth that I didn't study for. If I can give them the God I had, I believe there's nothing they can't do. You don't want to fumble the bag. You don't want your people to fumble the bag, your generation, next generation to fumble the bag. We have to make sure that we do what those who came before us did. We can't be so cool that we kick them out and tell them, find your way. Yeah, you better find your way with a firm foundation of God in your life. Solomon had the firm foundation of God in his life. It, it is, it is. Now, how does that work into not fumbling back? I'm glad you asked me. Here we go. He had the firm foundation of God in his life because faith finds the deepest satisfaction in God and God's presence, which helps counteract the things that erode, follow me, resource and opportunity. I was at a um, dinner with, with a friend and I was talking through conceptually what I was thinking about for this message on Solomon and how not to fumble the bag. And he looked at me as I was eating my garlic crack crab and garlic noodles. <laughs> and, and, and he said, um, how do you do that? He said, what makes a bad steward? He said, he said, how do you fumble what's been entrusted to you? I said, that's a good question. Because I, I, I submit to you that the very things that cause us to fumble, at the heart of it, it is a disregard for God at the center, God's plan, God's way, and God's purpose. But when God is at the center, it eradicates the things that dwindle or erode what has been entrusted to you. How? I told him I have a long list, but I'm just going to give you two real quick. And here's what the presence of God in my life, a true and living presence of God in my life should prevent. The two things that erode what's been entrusted. Um, when God is my delight, I'm not talking about in general, I'm talking about at the moment. When God is my delight, an unhealthy relationship with pleasure is not an issue. I told him there are two things that will erode what has been entrusted to you faster than anything. Number one, here we go. An unhealthy relationship with pleasure. Hear me. And I want to talk to y'all super saints who think pleasure is a sin. No, God desires for us to experience pleasure in every way. In the same way, God wants us to have good food. Food is not the issue. Gluttony is. Money is not the issue. A love of money, yes, and greed is. When he asked me, it almost came out of the blue because this was not in the passage, but notice this, two things that we wrote. Number one, we gotta get out of here, an unhealthy relationship with pleasure, if not managed, it erodes what has been entrusted to you. It will erode time, it will erode, res it will erode resource, it will erode the material that you need to build 
what is in your heart. And all the stuff that we're fighting out there becomes a lot easier when we can manage the stuff that we're fighting in here. But look at your neighbor like you, you not because super saints were like, mm hmm. Look at your neighbor and be honest. Look at him, tell him, but that ain't easy. That ain't easy. You human. And the quicker you understand that, I just did a, a talk to an interfaith group, and, 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 and my talk was you know, I wanted to come in there and talk about you know, getting things right on the global scale, but also at the personal level. And God gave me a message about seeing your own darkness. Because if we cannot see our own darkness, we cannot offer anything to the world because we'll simply judge everything that we see in the world while assuming we're not guilty of any of it. That is what produces this, everybody's a hater, everybody's after me, everybody's a narcissist. Well, let's talk about the narcissist in you. One of the things that's kept me from labeling a whole lot of people is to look at me and say, wait, wait a minute, Wayne. It may be 80% in them, but if it's 20% in you, you got some work to do before you go out there with your big, bad, bold self labeling everybody. Can, can, just while we're at it, any mental health professionals in here? All right, you, we probably get on your nerves, don't we? Be diagnosing, I think that's bipolar schizophrenia. I think that is narcissism. You saw an internet coach who got a degree from Dubai in electronics, but read mentally and healthy emotional leader and is now a coach. Dang, what happened? Is that y'all that was talking about? Like, what, what, what everybody do this to me? But the work, we're good at evaluating the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My discernment was on, told me something was trouble about them. But have you ever turned the light of your discernment like this? What did you see? Come on, I'll wait. <laughs> Because the ability to handle what is out there and to build properly and to take what God has entrusted us with and to build it and expand it with continuity to pass it on to the next generation, we've got to be aware of the things that will eat up. That will, there are things that with materials we have to build, but there are other things that will, will forgive the word, will cluck off, will sabotage, will minimize will limit. It is a shame for us to pass on to the next generation less materials than we received ourselves to build. But what does it? A couple things. Number one, and we're done, is an unhealthy relationship with pleasure. Because pleasure consumes resource, unhealthy relationship with pleasure, consumes material that is meant to build, not for the community, not for the family, not for a generation, but it forces us to consume the building material on ourselves. That's why the Bible says, follow me, lovers of pleasure will always be broke. But how do I manage this? Let's wake up with some disciplines, that's part of it. Part of it is the deep-seated need for something you're looking for in things rather than God. When God is properly established at the seat of your heart once again, it does not mean they're not temptation, does not mean they're things you don't give into, but the motivating factor in getting back to the assignment is easier when God is enthroned on the seat of your heart. Because pleasure will take away, it takes time away from the building, but it also takes resource away from the building. Not just with the things that we know, not just 
with the things that we are consumed with, that we know we're consumed with, not just eating and drinking and loving, but also, follow me, with laying, sleeping, being addicted to comfort, as opposed to embracing the discomfort that is necessary to actually build something. Pleasure will erode the building. The biggest indictment in David's kingdom was in the springtime when the kings went out to war. When he was to gear up and be the leader that was supposed to lead everybody in the battle, he had gained so much success that he sent in other soldiers, his second in command and other soldiers to do what he should have been leading. So as they were doing that in his comfort, in his, in his laziness, in his chill mode, while he should have been in battle, he is laying up at the crib. And as he's laying up at the crib, he looks over the balcony and sees somebody bathing. Ooh. And doesn't look. Now stumbling onto something, that's not the sin. You don't know what you may see. But he lingered. And after he lingered, he took action. Go get her for me. They tried to warn him, like, that's something. No, that's, something. that's, your, that's your boy Uriah's why he's like nah get her for me bring her here in that season where the great king david the man after god's own heart he was still a good man but in that season a pleasure it almost cost him his kingdom solomon does the right thing here but the indictment against solomon that takes away a profound legacy. If you really think about it, the Bible before this says, do not accumulate great, just great riches for yourself. Don't accumulate for yourself a bunch of chariots and horses. Don't accumulate as a king of Israel for yourself too many wives. Listen, it was a different time. He didn't say, just, just find one good one. That, that's later. In this context, he said too many. That's pretty reasonable. Like, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, you know. You know, Solomon, another 10, 20 that maybe, you know, can meet every need. You're a complex guy. I get it. <laughs> but 700 something. Amen. And the Bible's, what's, a, what's amen? <laughs> what kind of amen is that? <laughs> that was a heck of an amen. <laughs> Everybody said, hmm. Somebody said, amen. <laughs> All right, that means I'm gone too long. Let's wrap this up. I imagine this would happen in Jesus. He'd be talking on the countryside, you know what I mean? And somebody would just say, amen. He would like, uh, that was a misplaced amen, but we receive it. God knows your heart, you know? Let, let me get out of here. I got to finish real quick. We find that because he had given himself after he had great success to all those things, even someone with wisdom, someone who had built a great temple and built a great name, notice this. He begins to be led astray by the varying belief systems of all of the wives that he had taken in, which is another commentary in and of itself. But here is the idea. He gave himself more fully to pleasure and notice now his legacy is beginning to erode. It is not a spotless legacy. He had built great things, but number one, what will take away the building and what will erode the material, number one, is pleasure. And number two, because I'm not coming back next week. <laughs> Y'all gonna hear this number two. You gonna take this, you gonna get this number two today. <laughs> number two is fear. Amen. Somebody that says, I have my, I have my legacy. Under, I have my, my, my appetite under control. I have, I have my disciplines. I've, I've honored God. I've, I've done all these things. But can I tell you what your issue is? It is fear. Fear that 
what you have to build with is not enough? Fear that after it's built, maybe no one will celebrate it? Fear that while there's a great expectation that you'll exceed what your father did, that you will always be in your father's shadow. He, David was a great king. Fear. Notice this. With all of your qualifications, it was humility, but I'm sure there was a little bit of fear in Solomon. He, he says, I don't know what I'm doing, God. And can I tell you, when there's a task before you and there's any fear in your heart, no matter what the qualifications are, you will hold, you will sit on, you will delay your contribution to the world because to you, it will never be good enough. You can watch people that are half as intelligent with half the materials do twice as much as you and still not move with the materials to build anything that God has given you because you are paralyzed by fear. Fear of rejection, fear of what people may say, fear that it won't be good enough, fear that it won't meet your standard, fear that it'll tell the world, it'll, it'll reflect to the world what you are and what you aren't. And so you have ideas, you have vision, you have materials, you have resource. God has put something in your hand that you refuse to move out on because... You're trapped by fear. And one of the things that will cause this generation to fumble the bag is to sit on the resources that God has given them. To, to, you don't feel good enough. You're still trapped by the first, the, the, the manifestation of the first fall, and that was self-consciousness. After they ate of the fruit, they looked at themselves as opposed to looking at God for what is possible. For some of us in this place, God has called us to do more. He's given us what we need to build, and you feel unqualified. I can't do it like pastor does it, or I can't sing like the praise team. So you look at yourself, and in Fear, rather than looking at God for the possibilities, you look at your own personal limitations. And when you're gripped by fear, listen to me, one limitation will outweigh 100 strengths. You will look at yourself, and because of that deficit, refuse to go any further where there are people who can't articulate what you articulate, who don't have the concepts that you have, who don't have the ideas and, and, and the mental ingenuity that you have, who, who are doing twice as much, and you're stuck because of fear. Something that's not real. You're in your place, assuming you won't be celebrated, but you'll be laughed at, and nobody's even thinking about you. Let me talk to myself. Nobody's even thinking about us. And here's the reality. You sit where you are and do nothing, and they're talking about you anyway. <laughs> Look at your neighbor. Tell them you may as well give them a show, honey. You may as well give them a show. Give them something to look at. Give them something. Give God something to bless. Even if it is a bad, give God something. It's better to give God a half-cocked idea than nothing at all. But what traps us? Fear. I'm done, for real, for real. You can play the soft music to make sure. <laughs> but what does it? It's fear. It's, it's, it's fear. And here is the problem with the church and even my preaching. I've evolved a bit, but here is the problem. We focus on the same three or four things we say God's frustrated with. We, we, we zero in. Nothing wrong with it, but we zero in. We focus in on those things as if those are the only things that fall into the category of wickedness in the Bible. What did you smoke? What did you drink? Well, how much did you drink? Of what you drank? Who, who, who were you with? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Did, did, did you, did you, did, did you, did you cuss them out? Repent. 
Nothing wrong with those things. But can you allow me to broaden the category of wickedness? The Bible says, um, when it speaks of the parable, Jesus is teaching, on, gives the parable of the talents. Talents. The Bible says there's a rich man, wealthy man, who entrusted to the care of his servants, three servants, his resources. To one man, he gave five talents. Five. Not talents like tap dancing. A measure of money. He gave to one five talents. <laughs> he gave to another two talents. Gave to another one talent. Each according to his own measure. He goes away, the Bible says, for a long time. Say long time. Long time. Which shows, follow me, that promotion and demotion is not always instantaneous, but sometimes revealed over time. The nature of what you're building, the nature of your habits, the nature of the construction of what God's put in your heart will not be revealed in the first week or the first month or even the first year. But over time, the kind of builder you are will be revealed. There will be fruit or famine based on how you chose to build, what you did with what was entrusted to you. And rather than complaining about what you didn't have or what you didn't receive, let's look at what you do have and start from what you do have. Because we can't do anything about what you don't have. All we can use is what you do have. And here's what I know. When you first receive it, you will not be judged for what you what you did with what you have because nobody will see. At the beginning, everybody's building looks the same. But after a long time, it will become evident how you build. Built. It'll become evident. And here's what he says. After a long time, the master returned to get accounts. Oh, God's going to get an account of what we did or what we had. He said he went to the one that had five. <clears throat> the one that had five <coughs> gained five more. The one that had two gained two more. The one that had one said, I got a good idea. I don't have much. But because I had less than everybody else, I have a, a good reason for not doing anything. Doesn't that sound like today? Her mother left her a house that her and her brothers split. That's how she got the money to start her company. But I didn't have that. Well, well God doesn't expect fruit from seeds he didn't give you. He only expects a return from what he did give you. The man says, listen to me. He says, I only had one. So, so here's what I did. I didn't lose it. I have what you gave me. I buried it. I just buried it so I can give you back. I don't want to risk. So I can give you back what you gave me. Notice the words of the master. He doesn't call him frugal. He doesn't call him wise. Call him wise. He doesn't call him clever. He does not call him conservative. He said, listen to me, follow me. You wicked and lazy slave. You could have at least put my money in a bank account. You didn't have to double and triple it. You could at least put it in a bank account. So when I came back, I would have had a little interest. You could have, you didn't have to build me a temple. But you could have put one block on top of the other so that there was something more than what you were left with. He says, notice this, not frugal, not conservative, but you wicked and lazy slave. Notice this, he said, lazy, you were more concerned and consumed with your pleasure than you were with productivity. <laughs> number one, that's fumbling the bag. But number two, he says, wicked. Whew. Can we expand the definition of wickedness? 
He doesn't say in this context wickedness was who you laid with. He doesn't say in this context wickedness was what you smoked. He doesn't say in this context wickedness was how you went off on somebody in traffic. He says, I'm going to call this wicked because you were entrusted with a life that you did nothing with. You were entrusted with resource from people that worked their whole lives to pass on what they had to you, even if it was not much. And now that it's time for you, it was a disservice and a disgrace to those that came before you. But not only was it a disgrace to those that came before you, it's a deficit to those that will come after you. So now they don't start on even ground, but they start from a deficit position and they have to begin to work up to where you are to try to get beyond you. So he says, for that reason, you have not only slept on yourself, but you burden those that have come before you and those that will come after you. He said, that's wicked. Do you know one of the things when I was on cruise control? I said, I could do ministry pretty good by, by going to a couple conferences. I could do this. There's an anointing on my life. Do you know one of the things that convicted me to go back and to pursue education again? was that my great-grandfather was a slave in East Texas who bought a wife. I guess he wasn't feeling the rest of the folks in the plantation. He went and said, I'm going to hustle on the side. As a slave and bought a wife that he was in love with, realized according to his calculations that she wouldn't have been he, they couldn't have gotten free at the rate they were going. So with tears in his eyes, he sold her back into slavery in order to get the money to buy his freedom to go and fully, as a free man, accelerate the wealth that he was building enough to go back and buy her out of slavery in half the time. He didn't stop there. He went on with other pastors from East Texas and started helped to found Bishop's College in Texas, a college that educated people who could not receive an education or black clergy who could not receive an education from, from solid white institutions at the time. His son went on, the one that paid the groundwork with the older pastors, T.M. Chambers Sr., he went on to, to lay the foundation for Martin Luther King in the South when the older clergy members would not embrace him because his views were too radical. That son of his in my grandfather, born in 1897, he had a doctorate from Princeton in 1920. Okay, y'all know what's happening in 1920, right? And I said to myself, in the 2000s, I had passed to me a grandfather who was the son of a slave who had a Princeton doctorate in the 1920s. And I'm like, I got an anointing on my life. I didn't do it to intensify the anointing. I did that one for the culture. Are you still here with me? I didn't do it to intensify the anointing. I did that because there was no way a slave and the son of a slave was going to pursue more than I did with freedom, air, opportunity, are you with me, and resource. Now, I may never surpass what they did. They may have been five talent. I'm just going to take what God gave me and work this thing. And I don't know who you are. I don't know what you have. I don't know what mistakes you've made. I don't know what resources you lost. But sometimes losing good resource makes you intentional, intentional about what you have left. But I need some people in here who say I may only have one or two bricks, but I'm going to work these bad boys like there's no tomorrow. I'm going to take that one brick. I'm going to take that one plank of cedar and I'm going to do everything I can in my generation. I don't have time to talk about what I lost. I have time only to talk about what I'm going to do with what's left. Look at three people around you. Ask them, what are you going to do with what is left? I, I know you don't have everything that you friend had I know nothing was left for you but what are you gonna do with what's left I know you're afraid 
I know you feel unqualified. I know you feel limited. I know you feel like you don't have enough. But God sent me in this place to declare he'll make up in answer for, for an answered prayers what you did not have in your hand. Because what you need is not necessarily more stuff. You need what Solomon asked for. He said, God, would you give me wisdom? to do something with what I have. You're not another loan away from doing what you need. You're a revelation away from doing what you need. You don't need just more money. You need some wisdom to do something with what you have because with wisdom you can multiply a little. With wisdom you can work for nothing. With wisdom you can use somebody else's money to close the deal, take your feet, to build your empire back. Who am I talking to say God give me wisdom 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 and knowledge Lord if you give me wisdom and knowledge I could get it all back if you give me wisdom and knowledge I could give to my children what I didn't have for myself if you give me wisdom and knowledge I could grow this feeble thing into an empire is there anybody who knows God will give you wisdom I gotta go but James 1 5 through 8 says if any of you lack wisdom you should ask of God who gives generously open up your arms say generously to all who ask without finding fault in other words he's not gonna say you made some mistakes so I'm not gonna give you wisdom he's not gonna say you lost some resource so I'm not gonna give you wisdom he said he'll give it to anybody without finding fault he said but you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave tossed and blown by the wind that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord he says such a person is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways but whatever you've been through whatever you're going through and whatever you have left I dare you to throw up your hands open up your mouth and I don't need you to give God a shout of praise I need you to ask Ask God for what you need. Ask him for wisdom. Wisdom to build. Wisdom to create. Wisdom to open doors. Wisdom to get access. Wisdom to know who to talk to. Wisdom to take this little in my hand and build everything that's in my heart. Throw up your hands. You don't need my hands laid on you. You just need to talk to your source, your creator. Somebody cry out to the Lord for wisdom.